Welcome to The Fair Sense. With me, Tanya. And me, Kara. Women, money, and the fight to break even. Because we give a shit, and so should you. On today's episode, Financial Feminism. What's up, Kara? Hello, Tanya. Can I just tell you, I'm super excited about today's episode. I feel like we have so many things to talk about and so many different voices to hear from. I'm crazy excited. I feel like today's episode is really the crux of the fairer sense. This is this is really where we shine <laughs> and <laughs> something that we feel really, really passionate about. Yeah, we talk a lot about feminism here. And I think We do sometimes take for granted that everyone listening has an understanding of what feminism is when the reality is that there isn't a universally accepted definition. And so to further complicate matters, we're actually going to kind of coin a term and talk today about financial feminism specifically. Kara, what does financial feminism mean to you? Financial feminism means to me... I feel like I'm writing an essay in the fourth grade. (laughs) Or it's like a high school graduation. Webster's Dictionary defines financial feminism as... (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. Not cool. We can do better. We're so much wiser than we were in fourth grade and high school. God, I hope so. (laughs) Oh my God. Um, (laughs) So when we first sort of started talking about doing this episode, and then when we, we sort of crowdsourced the phrase, for me, the thing that rung the most true is this idea that women should have equal access to an equal management of money. And so that for me, obviously the wage gap is the hill that I will die on. I feel really strongly that women should get equal pay for equal work. But I also think this idea that women are not good with money, that women don't understand money, that money is not for women theoretically, literally, It really bothers me. It's something that I think manifests in a million different microaggressions and I'm over it. So for me, being a financial feminist is really having the belief that women can and should earn the same amount as men and that women are just as able to make good decisions with money as men. Oh, amen, sister. Of course, I agree. And I think I would just add that sort of like we've talked in the past about toxic masculinity and sort of the harm of traditional gender roles, I would like to see financial feminism also encompass the idea that if, for example, a woman manages a household's finances, what you might call low finance, that that doesn't mean she can't also manage the high finance, the investments, the retirement strategy, you know, the stuff that is longer term and tends to be thought of as the man's domain if we're talking about kind of the heteronormative marriage model of finance. There's no right or wrong way to do this. And women are welcome in every part. And taking on one part that might feel traditional doesn't say doesn't mean that you can't also participate in finances in the non-traditional way. Exactly. And I want to be very clear about something. This podcast and we as people are not out here to attack men. We're not out here saying men are the problem. We're saying we live in a world that favors men. And if you are not actively fighting to change that world to make it a more equal playing field, then yes, you are a part of the problem. And so when it comes to our money, it really, especially for women, especially for women of color, especially for disabled women, there are so many obstacles to simply getting the money. And then there's so much bullshit tied up in how we use and spend that money that just need to be done away with. Totally. I was thinking just today, looking at Twitter, I saw a friend who was talking about a side hustle getting bank account sign-up bonuses, where if you put $1,000 into an account for three months, the bank will give you $400 or something like that. Chase offers these offers semi-regularly. And I was just thinking, isn't that nice? Yet another way. I mean, like, good for that friend. (laughs) No shame, no shade. But the only way that you can get that is if you can stand to not have access to your thousand dollars for three months or more. And that's not the reality for so many people. So like, yay, rich get richer. That is something where 
if you just sort of understand on a basic level that not every opportunity is open to every person. So therefore, a lot of folks just simply can't get ahead. And a lot of those folks happen to be women or women of color, or like you said, women with disabilities, trans women, you know, all sorts of categories of people who have various disadvantages, that it's just going to result in a different society and one in which equality is not even possible. And I know we'd all love to think that it's possible and we all want to believe in the American dream, but, you know, the data show that the social mobility is lower in the U.S. than in any other developed country now. We're at disparities between the rich and poor so great at the moment that they match where we were during the Great Depression. And we're just not in an equal society. And if we want to get to an equal place, we have to really embrace financial feminism. Amen. We wanted to ask some friends of the podcast what financial feminism means to them, and we got some answers. Emily, who writes the blog Wise Mind Money, said, I think to me, financial feminism means recognizing that money and class deeply permeate every feminist issue and more broadly, basically everything. I think becoming a financial feminist was very gradual for me, but it first started when I really started noticing, humanizing, and having compassion for people who were in more difficult financial and economic situations than me, which began in childhood and evolved in many ways and continues to do so as I grew into adulthood. I love that, Emily. That's such a great encapsulation of financial feminism. And I also just appreciate how she shared her growth on it. Because I, I don't think necessarily any of us are born being great feminists or, you know, kind of having the awareness of the things that that show us that feminism is necessary. Thank you. I'm very into the idea of growth. And I think we need to make space for people to grow publicly. You know, spoiler alert, we brought back the boys for this episode. <laughs> and when I was talking to T-Bone about doing it again, at first he said, well, I don't know. I mean, I've made problematic jokes in the past. And I said, yeah, I know. We all have. <laughs> like, maybe not necessarily jokes, but no one came out of the womb and was fully evolved socially, you know? Um, no one was woke from birth. We've all had to learn and be educated on different topics, maybe, because we all have different experiences. But I think it's so important for us to make space on this podcast for people who have grown into becoming financial feminists. And I love that Emily touches on that. I mean, here, T-Bone, I'm going to make you feel better right now because full confession I don't think that I identified with the term feminist until probably my late 20s. And the way that I see that and the way that I see a lot of people, like when young women in Hollywood are asked, are you a feminist? And they're like, hell no. To me, that just means you haven't experienced certain things yet. Um, like, I think it's okay to grow into it and to accept that a lot of young women aren't really going to see the need for it. Because these days in school, girls do on average get higher grades. So a lot of folks who are high achievers in K through 12 and in college tend to be young women. And then in the workplace, in virtually all professions, women are equaling the numbers of men, if not actually exceeding that and all but, you know, some of the really STEM focused fields in tech. It takes you a while to climb up and to actually experience the glass ceiling before you necessarily see that level of sexism or the stuff that's really institutional or systemic. And so that was totally me. You know, I was like high in my class. I got good grades. I was a high achiever. I went to college, was surrounded by kick-ass women and great women faculty. And it just sort of never occurred to me. And then I went to work for a company that was heavily led by women. And you know, I don't even know that I would say I experienced sexism on the job directly in my workplace, but I certainly experienced it with clients and with other situations. So it definitely was something I had to grow into. And so if that's you too, like no shame. What counts is the growth, not the starting point. Yeah. And I think too, going back to what you said earlier, uh, not everyone who listens knows the definition of feminism because there is not one agreed upon definition. There's also a uh, feminism in some circles in some places has a really bad reputation and it's equated with man hating. And there's lots of people out there. There's lots of women out there who love men and shy away from the feminist label because they don't want to be associated with hating men. I get that. I totally understand. I don't want to be associated with hating men. I want to be associated with wanting equality for women and not being afraid to speak out against systems and or, yes, sometimes men that are upholding those systems. Really, a lot of stuff can come from a place of simply being unaware. I think also, too, a lot of stuff can come from a place of being willfully ignorant, and that's what I have a problem with. But growth, baby, we're all here, we're all here to grow. 
So along those lines, here is another friend's definition. To me, it means equity with your partner or spouse in making major financial decisions that affect the household, and also a division of labor surrounding financial responsibilities. While I don't think it's important for each person in a relationship to know all of the nitty gritty, I think that major financial decisions and discussions should be tackled as a team. I realized I was a financial feminist when my father died and my mom was left making a lot of financial decisions for the first time in her life without having the knowledge or confidence that my dad achieved over his lifetime. That comes from our friend, Little Green Revelation. Yeah. And then I think just one more to add is from our friend Lee. She says, to me, it was prioritizing my finances when I was single and never planning with any assumptions of getting married at some point, saving for retirement because women live longer and buying this condo on my own were important. And she also said, now that I'm married, it means that we are both involved in the decisions equally. Once money goes into the joint account, it doesn't matter who earned it. We both get to decide what to do with it. So I love those three takes that we got on financial feminism. And I want to expand this. Some of you guys are probably familiar with the TED Talk called We Should All Be Feminists by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. You should listen to the whole thing. We will link to it in the show notes. But we want to play for you a clip of it now. What if both boys and girls were raised not to link masculinity with money? What if the attitude was not the boy has to pay, but rather whoever has more should pay? Now, of course, because of the historical advantage, it is mostly men who will have more today. But if we start raising children differently, then in 50 years, in 100 years, boys will no longer have the pressure of having to prove this masculinity. But by far the worst thing we do to males by making them feel that they have to be hard is that we leave them with very fragile egos. The more hard man a man feels compelled to be, the weaker his ego is. And then we do a much greater disservice to girls because we raise them to cater to the fragile egos of men. We teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller. We say to girls, you can have ambition, but not too much. <laughs> you should aim to be successful, but not too successful. Otherwise, you will threaten the man. If you are the breadwinner in your relationship with a man, you have to pretend that you're not especially in public, otherwise you will emasculate him. But what if we question the premise itself? Why should a woman's success be a threat to a man? What if we decide to simply dispose of that word? And I don't think there's an English word I dislike more than emasculation. A Nigerian acquaintance once asked me if I was worried that men would be intimidated by me. I was not worried at all. In fact, it had not occurred to me to be worried because a man who will be intimidated by me is exactly the kind of man I would have no interest in. So y'all know how much we love Ali Wong. We've talked about her a bunch of times. And she has this pretty incredible joke in her last stand-up special, Hard Knock Wife, where she talks about getting famous and how she started to make a lot more money than her husband. And she has this joke, which is so much funnier when she says it, but you should definitely go watch the special. I'm going to read it. It won't be nearly as funny, but just imagine it in her sassy delivery. She says, my mom is very concerned that he is going to leave me out of intimidation. I had to explain to her that the only kind of man that would leave a woman who makes more money is the kind of man that doesn't like free money. And of course, everyone laughs. And that's one of those things where it's like, oh, yes, of course, logically, like everyone likes free money. But that's not actually the economic reality. It turns out almost 40% of wives earn more than their husbands, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But when they talk about it on surveys or out in public, they lie. And women tend to actually underreport their salary and men overreport their salary, which is so fascinating. So like we as a society are definitely not at a place, men and women, where we're comfortable acknowledging when women earn more. 
yeah, we as a society are not financial feminists. Yeah. We're clinging in many ways to these, I'm using air quotes, traditional gender roles and financial roles that the man will bring home the bacon. And if the woman earns something, it won't be as much as the man. And that's totally ridiculous. It's also incredibly heteronormative. It really bums me out on a personal level that we are still having this conversation. And it also bums me out on a societal level because as women get more opportunities, as women do become more educated, more women are graduating college than ever before, more women are graduating college than men, we should be financially rewarded for our skills and our work. And that should be a great thing for society. That's the thing that puzzles me. You know, I love what Chimamanda says in her TED Talk. What if we question the premise itself? Why should a woman's success be a threat to a man? Like, yeah, why are we even looking at it that way? Shouldn't more money for every household be a good thing? Shouldn't more social mobility for more people be a good thing? That's supposed to be the American dream, right? Why is there this consistent discomfort with women climbing and with women earning more? It's just that has to die. Burn it with fire. My favorite part of the clip was the part that made an appearance in a Beyonce song a few years ago about girls shrinking themselves. If that doesn't friggin' sum it up right there, (laughs) we say to women, you can be anything, you can do anything, we'll pay you anything, but not as much as the man. And that truly is the heart of sexism because what it says is we want you to go out and achieve, but fundamentally we don't believe you are as valuable as a man. And that is awful. 100%. There's nothing else to say. Nothing else to say. I sat down again with the one, the only T-Bone and asked him about being a financial feminist. I grew up in a household that was somewhat conservative. I definitely learned traditional gender roles, uh, mostly around vulnerability. Uh, You know, it's not okay for men to cry, more okay for women. I remember my mom actually making fun of my dad for crying at Forrest Gump. Both my parents worked. I was never taught that women were less than in value to to men, but I definitely learned traditional gender roles. And as I got older, as I went to college, I mean, I remember making inappropriate jokes, but thinking, oh, I'm just being satirical and not really realizing the violence that sexism manifests as and uh, just learning about the pay gap and daily violence and uh, aggressions, both uh, physical and otherwise, that women face um, that men just don't. I just started to notice those more and more and realized that feminism is not a, it's not an option. It's I mean, it's critical to actually achieving real social justice. One of the biggest differences between you and me is you are non-confrontational and I am confrontational. (laughs) And I don't mean that it's like you never, ever confront people and I'm constantly confronting people, but I feel really comfortable in an everyday conversation pointing out, so here's why that's problematic, or I actually disagree with you and here's why. And you're much more likely to want to keep the peace. Do you feel comfortable confronting Specifically other dudes when you see sexist behavior? Sometimes. I mean, it depends on, I guess, the level of it. Like if somebody is making a rape joke, I have no problem calling them out on that and saying, this is not okay and, you know, here's why. But I think a lot of the more like insidious things, I, you know, I've heard my, my dad and my brothers make jokes about just how, how men think versus how women think. And I often do call them out on that or I'll just say, you know, actually, I think I kind of think more like what you would say a woman thinks like in this situation just to kind of make them not see this as a black and white issue here, biological differences between men and women. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the situation, how comfortable I am with the person, how I guess flagrant it feels to me. But I also recognize that it's often the things that don't seem like a big deal that are like the most insidious parts of sexism that need to be addressed. So that's something that I think a lot of feminist allies, particularly straight men, there's a bit of a disconnect there where, you know, if someone's like, you're a bitch to a woman, they're like, aha, sexism, I see it. (laughs) But if someone says something more along the lines of, well, I don't really think it's a problem that there are no female speakers at this conference because the people they got are all experts and it's really just who's the best at their job. Like, that's who I want to be learning from. 
like that is really sexist and that plays out in a lot of different ways. And I don't think as many allies feel comfortable saying, okay, hey, this is more of a gray area, but we should unpack this. And I really wish they would along those lines. What do you think is the best way to explain the patriarchy to dudes? And did anything specifically help you see the light? I don't know that there's any one thing, just a lot of similar examples. The one that's Coming to mind, just thinking about questions that women get that men don't get. There's a Parks and Rec episode where Ben Wyatt is running for Congress and his wife, the, you know, the main character, Leslie, is questioned about like where her kids are because she's at this event with him. And he's like, nobody ever asked me that question. And there are just a million examples like that where we expect certain things of women that we don't expect of men and vice versa. There is another Parks and Rep episode where Catherine Hahn's character asks Ben to run for Congress. And then he gets a little drunk and he's like, I don't know, should I do this? Like, should I be a congressman or congresswoman? Wait, no, that doesn't apply here. <laughs> and that always makes me think of you because you'll do stuff like that a lot where you'll catch yourself saying something and then you're like, wait a second, is that sexist or is that not as inclusive as I want it to be? Let me try using a better phrasing. And occasionally it doesn't apply. <laughs> but I really love that about you. I really love that you in everyday scenarios, it's not you don't just wait to get up on your pedestal about stuff and say, this is the hill I will die on. You really do try to continually push yourself and the people around you in small ways. Yeah. And I, I do feel like it's I hate to quote the Bible, but there's there's some good stuff in there. There's the one verse about before you pull the speck out of your neighbor's eyes, pull the plank out of your own. I mean, I think it's most important to recognize where you're acting on your own biases and where you might have blind spots before you go around pointing out other people's. And at the same time, I don't think you should ignore other people's, but like yelling at them, I think is rarely going to get them to reevaluate why they think a certain way or why they feel like something is okay to say. I think just more framing it as, have you ever considered this? Or there's a perspective that you're not considering that I think if you did, you would realize what you're saying or what you're doing is not okay. So I would say the biggest difference between you and I when it comes to confronting these things is that I am very willing to write people off and you are not. <laughs> We just had this conversation yesterday, you know, where I feel really strongly, and I've said this before in the podcast, but I have lines in the sand. And if people cross them, I do not feel the need to reach out and educate them or say, hey, just so you know, like, here's my point of view. Tell me your point of view. I'm so curious. Let's meet in the middle. I'm like, no, I am on the side of justice. You need to get over here or you need to get out of my way. <laughs> and you don't feel that way. So can you share a little bit more about how you think we need to communicate with people we don't agree with. Okay. So if your your puppy shits on the floor, you don't want the dog to do that again. So you rub its nose in it and you know say like bad dog or whatever. I'm less interested in rubbing the dog's nose in its own shit than I am in it not shitting on the floor again. And so I don't think that just making people feel bad about themselves for the things that they do or say like if it's not going to help them change their minds, not that it's pointless, but it doesn't really, I mean, it just doesn't get them to change. And I think that's the ultimate goal. And it's not a kind thing to do, which I know that being kind is not always effective in creating change, but I think that's the place where you should start. I disagree with you. I really think that we don't need to be kind to the people who are willfully ignorant and who are doing damage. So Nancy Pelosi has spoken out about how we need to be polite to the people who are doing bad things. Specifically, she said, and this is not a direct quote, people out harassing or giving Trump staff members or conservatives a hard time in public places. She was like, you know, we don't need to be doing this. That's not the way to get things done. Versus someone like Maxine Waters, who was like, hey, if you see someone out there doing shitty things or who you know is doing shitty things, you can give them a hard time. She was not calling for you to like 
egg their house. But she said, you know, you can go up and you can say, I think you're doing bad things. We have the right to exercise that. And I think we should. And I think we should make people who are doing shitty things uncomfortable, whether that's making sexist comments or whether that's passing sexist laws. I actually really don't think that now is the time to be kind. I think now is the time to be forceful for what we see as justice. And I mean, I don't disagree. I don't think when I say be kind, I, that doesn't preclude making people uncomfortable. That just means don't attack them as a person rather than saying you're a terrible person. Go fuck yourself. I think saying this is a terrible policy or this viewpoint is really damaging. Like you're being inconsiderate. You're being unkind. You're being sexist. These are different from saying fuck you. And I think like that's the line that I'm drawing. So I want to talk to you about money. Right now, you still make more money than I do. But theoretically, if I was the breadwinner, would that make you uncomfortable? There was a recent article that came out that said in straight couples where the woman makes more, the couple is more likely to deflate the woman's income and inflate the man's income to try to adhere to traditional gender norms. Would that bother you in our relationship? Not at all. That would be great if you made more money than me. Do you feel comfortable calling yourself a feminist in mixed gendered company? 100%. Yeah. If you don't feel comfortable with the term feminist, you either don't understand what it means or you're an, an asshole. Put that on a t-shirt. Let me wear it around. <laughs> would you wear that t-shirt? Uh, you know, I think I would actually. Yeah. I mean, I just, I consider feminism the idea that women are equally capable as men of anything that matters. So as you know, we have monetized this podcast and we strive to work with sponsors that have the same values that we do. We're not taking money from people who punch puppies and fire women for getting pregnant. One such cool company is Autoslash. Raise your hand if you've ever rented a car and hated the experience. Oh my God, I have so many times. But Autoslash makes it better. They figure out the best coupons and discount codes to get you the lowest rate possible and then track prices on your rental right up until the day you pick up the car. If they find a lower rate, they email you so you can lock in the savings. And it's the number one site for cheap car rentals, so it's perfect for anyone trying to save money. And Autoslash works with all the major rental companies like Hertz, Avis, and Thrifty. Plus, super awesome bonus, renters save an average of 30% or more when they use Autoslash. Since they track coupons before you book and compare rates after you book, Autoslash ensures you get the best deal. Save yourself the time and the money by letting them do the heavy lifting. Head to autoslash.com to check out some of their deals today. And of course, you know, if Kara talked to T-Bone, I talked to Mark and asked him a lot of the same questions, but we had a kind of different discussion. I think maybe some of it's generational, but you be the judge. I do consider myself a feminist, although I think the term has sort of, the bar has been raised in a lot of ways on what that means. Um, so I don't know if I always qualify <laughs> as a feminist. Maybe two years ago or three years ago when a lot of celebrities were getting asked, do you consider yourself a feminist? There were sort of two strains of answers and one was really basic, you know, is yes, I think women and men should be equal and women should get equal opportunities. And that's, you know, certainly a fair definition of feminism, but I don't think it goes far enough. So then when I say I consider myself a feminist, am I actually constantly aware and being sensitive and responsive to the many ways in which day to day women are challenged and, you know, have things harder? Calling myself a feminist is seems like a high bar and I probably don't always live up to it, but I certainly aspire to that. My sense is, I'm curious what your take is, my sense is that you would not have used the term or the label feminist when we first got together. Do you think that's true? Probably not, although I, in reality, I probably hadn't given it any thought. It certainly wasn't like an active part of my thinking or, yeah, and, and probably I wouldn't have qualified as one either <laughs> but, by anybody's definition. But no, I, I certainly wouldn't have thought about myself that way. Which I think no shame for that when we first got together I wouldn't have used the term. So expecting you to have is a little bit unrealistic. And I think you're being too hard on yourself. I think that feminism is about committing to the simple principle of women's equality. Then the rest of it is really just about keeping your eyes open and keeping your mind open. And I do feel like you've come a long way in understanding some of the things that women are up against every day that I'm sure you didn't see before we started talking about those things. You would acknowledge that that's true, right? 
Yeah, I think that's true. I I did have a professor in college who was also my thesis advisor and really like we stayed close and are still in touch to this day, 20 some years ago later, who was a pretty active feminist and injected that into a lot of what we learned, including classes on sort of organizational behavior and things. So I was a little bit attuned, like when I started work, I think, to power differentials. And certainly, I mean, at that point in the late 90s, a lot of the conversation was more about sexual harassment in the workplace. And to me, that seemed pretty basic. Obviously, 20 years later, we're having another reckoning on this. So maybe it wasn't actually that low a bar. But, you know, so I tried to be cognizant about power differentials and just how I treated women in the workplace to some degree and certainly avoiding sexual harassment in the workplace. But there wasn't really much conversation about wage gap and certainly about women not getting equal share in meetings, things like that. You know, men talking over women. I'm sure I'm guilty of a lot of those things along the way because, in again, in some ways, it seems like the conversation was more rudimentary back then. But here we are 20 years later still having the same conversation. You made an interesting link there of like, it's not just about harassment or sort of what I would almost call like the basic human rights aspect of feminism, but really the money piece. Like for you, was was there a moment or an experience that kind of crystallized for you that women still aren't anywhere close to financially equal, even if all appearances are in school and in offices that everybody's on equal footing? I don't know if there was a moment that crystallized it for me personally. You and I both worked for a progressive organization, so I think we both wanted to assume or assumed that that wasn't an issue at our organizations. The problem with some sexism and wage gap in particular is that it's not conscious, it's not deliberate in a lot of cases. It's systemic and it's, you know, built up over time. The issue of prior salary dictating starting salary for certain positions, things like that. And the way people handle negotiations on both sides when it comes to salaries, both the employer and employee. So, you know, I was aware that it existed. Um, I never really thought about it in my own career, in part because salaries were very considered very confidential at my company. And the one time I did, in fact, talk, not even in specific numbers, but general terms to a colleague, it got back to my boss and I got in trouble for discussing it. So, but I think in that case, actually there, it turned out there had been a wage gap between me and a female colleague. So I guess if there was any moment when I saw that in person, it could have been with that one coworker, but it's hard to know, you know, that didn't sort of change my thinking or it wasn't like an aha moment, I would say. And you and I, even though I've, you know, we've been aware of course of our wage differentials, we work for different companies and it's always a little more senior. So it's always I know we have a difference of opinion on this, but it's always felt like a little more apples and oranges. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. And I think you're so right that it's hard to know if your own company has a wage gap and whether it's affecting you personally or people you know personally, because like you said, a huge part of the wage gap has nothing to do with employers deliberately making a choice to pay women less. It's just that if you give everybody a sort of equal raise when they come in over what they were making before, but the men tend to come in at higher starting salaries, you're just going to perpetuate the wage gap. I suspect that my company did and does have a wage gap because many of the women tended to start out more junior and just kind of get the incremental promotions while men tended to come in from outside positions. And I think that's a recipe for them coming in and starting higher. And in lieu of them doing something like Salesforce did and doing a big pay audit and deciding to bump all the women up, I just can't imagine that it's completely equal across gender. I'm sure it's equal across, for example, people who started at similar times in junior roles, but you know, there are a whole lot of factors that cause it. I guess on an individual level, like a guy is never going to have an incentive to recognize the wage gap. Like if you found out that a woman colleague at a similar level made less than you, ego is just going to tell you, well, yeah, that may be true, but I'm probably doing a better job. Like I've brought in more business or I do this part of the job better. And I probably had a bit of that reaction too when I found out. Now I was a year or two ahead of this colleague. I think I was better at certain aspects of the job, but like I'm sure also that the wage gap was part of it. But I, you know, you tend to focus on the things that are going to reinforce that you're doing a good job and deserve the higher pay rather than thinking, oh, I don't actually deserve as much as I'm making. I think that's a superhuman reaction. It's like all of the junior staff thinking, oh, I'm deserving of a promotion. And managers are like, uh, you don't deserve a promotion just because you're doing your job. <laughs> Good for you for recognizing that. Thanks. <laughs> so yeah, so thinking about kind of where you are now, 
in all of this stuff and and thinking about women and money, it does feel like Kara and I can keep having this podcast and having these conversations. And certainly we're reaching a particular set of folks. But in reality, the people who are the worst offenders in holding women back are not listening to the fairer sense or reading Jezebel or following feminist luminaries on Twitter. So thinking about the patriarchy out there who hold so many of the purse strings, I mean, like, what do you wish people knew or what do you know now <laughs> you're making a face i don't know say something smart how do we fix society um <laughs> <laughs> now if you were going back into the workplace or if you were going to start a company and folks were having kind of this discussion of like well so and so man came in at x and so we need to pay him more to get him and the women started at blah 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 like i mean what do you think you would say in those conversations to try to level things out I don't know about in those conversations. I mean, two things. One, obviously, we just need to keep highlighting it um, in the news, in trade journals, bigger companies, I assume and hope that HR executives are reading current research and professional publications and then making conscious efforts to audit, you know, to do internal audits and compare salaries of men and women and and white workers and people of color and things like that to make sure that these biases aren't pervading their own companies. I feel like it's a little harder in smaller companies. You know, you worked for a small mid-sized company. I worked for a smaller company. There was no like true, I would say, HR professional at our company whose job it was to think deeply about these things and, and look carefully to make sure. But still, the more these conversations are happening in the news, in pop culture, things like that, it just needs to be called attention to on podcasts and elsewhere, you know, to make sure that it's being addressed. And then, yeah, you know, like actually doing the analysis and looking at it. I think, you know, having salary ranges for a position rather than basing things on past earnings, uh, you know, states like California that have passed laws that say you can't actually ask for salary history. I think that kind of thing is helpful. But for me, it seems like it's putting, you talk a lot about um, in your own financial savings about putting systems in place to fight your own bad habits. And I think for companies, it's the same way, like being rigorous and systematic about it so that any one hiring you know, manager or someone who's hiring an assistant doesn't have total leeway on, on salaries because then you'll accidentally or inadvertently, but in a lot of cases inadvertently, end up perpetuating those wage gaps and problems. You mentioned some good potential solutions offering a range for any position and making that clear in the job listing. Another option that some folks continue to float is making salaries transparent so that people know what everyone in the company is getting paid. I mean, how would that have made you feel if everyone you worked with knew what you were earning back when you were working? Yeah, my initial reaction to that is kind of nervous because I, I mean, I do know that I earned more than I think some of my colleagues. You know, at my company, part of once you got to a higher level, part of your earnings was based on how much business you brought in. So that obviously varies from person to person at the same level quite a bit. No, I mean, it's so having full salary transparency is so different than I think what almost all of us are used to that it's hard to, it, it feels kind of shocking and makes me nervous to think about, even though I don't really know why. I feel a few things about it. Like, I feel like I would have wanted it to be open because I, I do think I was potentially underpaid compared to some male colleagues, especially ones who came in from outside, whereas I was with my company for a very long time. But I also think like in a company like mine, where we saw everyone's billable hours, that could result in like a hours arms race that if you saw, okay, well, so-and-so is making more, but they're also billing more hours. Like there would just be more pressure to work more, which, oh my gosh, I think if I had had to work more than I did, I would have died. <laughs> well, there's also the example of CEO pay where there, where corporations did move to transparency with the idea that that would, I think, at the time, sort of equalize it and maybe help keep it under control. But in fact, it, it led to an, a pay arms race and, you know, just a real explosion of CEO pay. And you probably know the numbers better, but something like CEOs now make 300 times what the average worker at their company does because every CEO can see what everybody else makes. So wearing an employer's hat, you know, if everybody sees what everybody else is making, nobody is going to ratchet down salaries as a result of that. It means that everybody who's not getting paid equally will get ratcheted up. That's probably a good thing in terms of pay equity, but it could also be pretty tough for a lot of companies to make that work. Amen. No easy answers. Nope. Nope. 
can I just say, I love how much the guys are both willing to own up for past imperfections. I, I think that's so admirable that they not only do that self-reflection and are willing to grow, but also are willing to admit it publicly uh, because it's not like these were secretly taped conversations. They know exactly what we're doing with them. I think that's something that I try and stress to T-Bone all the time because he carries around a lot of guilt about past behavior. And I'm talking about like jokes he made in high school, you know, that have there are over a decade. He's learned so much. He's grown so much and he really beats himself up about it sometimes. But I think it's so incredible that he can recognize that it was problematic he can feel bad about it. And he is doing better actively every day. I mean, that's the dream. <laughs> like That's what I want so many more people to do. Totally. I mean, the fact that he said in your chat with him, and I quote, if you don't identify with the word feminist, you either don't understand what it means or you're an asshole. Like, <laughs> he clearly gets it now. And that's what matters. T-Bone, you rock. Oh my goodness, he's going to be so jazzed to hear that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know, something that I, I really appreciated, well, sort of loved and hate about what Mark said was the the wage gap and pay scales and saying, if you're getting paid more than someone, you want to believe it's because you're working harder, you are more valuable than them, your output is more valuable or whatever. And you don't inherently go to, oh yeah, this is the gender wage gap which I totally understand on one level because, of course, people are out here working hard, using their degrees, whatever. You know, like that work deserves to be acknowledged and paid for. Again, like I often say, nothing exists in a vacuum. So that's working within the context of the patriarchy and thus the wage gap. But to hear Mark say, I used to think this way and now I think this way and now I can see the bigger picture. Again, that's the growth we are looking for, people. I've tried to think back and force myself to reckon with this too, because certainly if I had seen that a male colleague was getting paid more than I was, I would have said like, hey, wage gap, that's unfair. You know, if I had found out that a colleague who was a woman of color got paid less than I did, you know, I don't know that I would have assumed, oh, there's something systemic here, or this is racist, or this is, you know, sexist in a different way. I probably would have had a similar explanation because, you know, like I was awesome at my job. <laughs> I was like a great client counselor. I was a great representative of my company. And I think in all honesty, that's where my mind would have gone first. And so I'm trying to own that in my efforts to not just be really a feminist, but also be an intersectional feminist and to understand that it's not just about like women generally having equity, but that there are also inequities among women. And so, yeah, I I'm admitting that here in hopes that that gives other folks permission to admit similar things so that we can all collectively grow and do better. Once again, nobody is born perfect. No one is born understanding the nuances and the intricacies. And just honestly, the scale of issues that we're up against. So I think it's so important that this podcast be a safe space for people to reach out to us if you want to shoot us an email or tweet at us and to say, yeah, I didn't know this thing. And now I do. And you know, I, I'm going to paraphrase this quote that once again, I saw on Tumblr. I feel like all my quotes are, I'm like, I saw this thing on Tumblr. <laughs> but Tumblr, no shame. Tumblr is my ultimate safe space. And I love it there. It was something along the lines of my mom once told me the first thought you have when you see something is what you were told to believe. It's kind of like your inherent bias. The second thought you have is what you've learned what your experiences have taught you. So for example, if you see a woman and you think sex object, but then you catch yourself and say, oh, why do I think sex object? That first one is not your, doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's not your fault. It's who you are is in the second thought. It's in the, I'm choosing to challenge this. I'm choosing to say, why do I think that way? Is there a better thought that I could have? Could I view this woman as a non-sex object? That is so inherently tied up in feminism because Feminism has had different iterations. It's meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I know plenty of women now who prefer to refer to themselves as womanist instead of feminist. And, and even as we hear it now have coined a new phrase in financial feminism, we're adding another layer to this. So we're all walking through the layers, climbing up the stairs. I don't know. I'm picturing like walking through spider webs. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, some are clinging to us, some are not, but we're still going through it. <laughs> That's okay. That really is okay. 
There was a great explainer on Vox recently about the different waves of feminism, which I think is a really helpful primer for those who aren't clear on it. And I'm going to take credit as Gen X for the womanist category, because that's actually part of early third wave feminism, which the way that they described it as first wave was like the suffragettes, which we've talked about before on the show, involved some heavy tinges of racism, not from everybody, but certainly from some corners. And that is something we should not overlook. Um, The second wave was really the the part of feminism in the 60s and 70s that gave feminism a bad name, the idea of the bra burners, which FYI, that never happened. There was no large scale bra burning. And then third wave is really like the 90s forward, like the riot girls. And some would argue that the third wave is still happening, but others would argue that the online feminism and the on online organizing is the fourth wave. So maybe financial feminism is the fifth wave. Ooh, yes. I love it. Trendsetters, wave starters. <laughs> also, can I just say shout out to our friend on Twitter, Done by 40 who once tweeted at us, uh, every time he listens to the show, he envisions the Kesha song, Woman, which if you are not familiar, <laughs> the lyric is, I'm a motherfucking woman. <laughs> so good. First of all, I'm a Kesha stan forever. I love Kesha. Second of all, I love that song. And I think about like large scale, even though it didn't happen, large scale bra burnings with Kesha playing in the background. I'm like, invite me to that party. Yeah. I also want to just give um, our friend Done by 40, uh, the blogger, a shout out because he is a great example on Twitter of what it means to be a male ally whenever trolls come after me, which is like pretty often these days, they often will do the faux apology of, oh, I'm I'm sorry if you were offended. I'm sorry if you misinterpreted my words. And he always jumps in and is like, dude. (laughs) (laughs) Or sometimes he'll like jump in on other parts of it. And I just love that. Like I love anyone who is committed to being an ally and is willing to stick their neck out for folks who are always having to fight the same fight over and over. So you rock. Yes. Actually, you know what? Let's just take a quick second here. There's a couple other dudes I want to give a little shout out to on Twitter. Um, Yes. Matt at Optimize Your Life. He is the best. I love you. Like It's weird because I don't know you that well, (laughs) but he often will point out when someone is sort of along the same lines as what Done by 40 does for you, Tanya. We hope point out like someone's argument is super gendered and thus super sexist and he just like calls out people's bullshit right and left like he calls out trump's bullshit it's just amazing and i love him and he also is a dad and he'll be like i've spit up on my shirt (laughs) (laughs) so love that and one other gentleman with whom i'm not super duper familiar but his handle is zero day finance and he has been pretty vocal around levels of inequality when it comes to wealth and Um, inequality in some gender stuff. And it's just so refreshing. There's some jokes on personal finance Twitter (laughs) about like feminist personal finance Twitter. And we do all have each other's backs in some ways, which is amazing. But it's awesome when dudes are feminists, point blank. It's awesome when dudes are feminists, but it's awesome when they get involved in the conversations, particularly on Twitter, which can be a very toxic place. So I just want to let y'all know we see you. We appreciate you. Thanks for being here with us. Absolutely. I know that there are a lot of folks who are scared off when they see the conversation going in a gender direction. And I get it. But I also feel like, yeah, that must be nice to just be able to retreat to the corners of the internet where you feel totally safe all the time and not to have to have hard conversations. Like, I'd love to have that privilege, but I don't. And so I know it's hard for a lot of guys to to take that on, but the ones who do, you are our heroes. Thank you very much. And way to push the financial feminism. So today's episode really came straight from the heart. And I also feel like it rejuvenated me in some ways. I'm feeling ready (laughs) more so than ever to fight the patriarchy. Um, But I just think, as always, it's so important to view everything through different lenses, right? We need to understand that everything is intersectional. Nothing exists in a vacuum, including our gender, including our money. Yes, absolutely. And we'd love to hear from you all, as always. You know, when you think about the term financial feminism, what does it evoke for you? What does it mean to you? What does being financially equal in the world look like? Uh, What will it take to achieve that? Shoot us your answers. You can reach us at Twitter, at Fairer Sense. You can email us, 
at fairersense at gmail.com or you can leave comments on the show notes at thefairersense.com. Yeah, I can almost guarantee. In fact, you know what? I can go ahead and guarantee this is half my podcast. <laughs> that <laughs> Anyone who answers that question, we will read some of your responses out on a bonus episode because it is such a pivotal question for why we're even doing this podcast. And it goes to the heart of what we want to talk about here, finances and feminism. So I really am curious and I would love to hear from y'all. Yeah, a hundred percent. Please write us. And if you are enjoying the show, please leave us a review, especially if you're an iTunes user. Those iTunes reviews count way more than you think. So if you could give us a star review, we'd be super, super grateful. But most of all, just let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. And most of all, most of all, stay rad. Stay rad. The Fairer Sense are me, Tanya Hester, and the world's best co-host, Kara Perez. Our theme song is by The Insider. Our ad music is by Kevin McLeod. And you can find out more info about the other artists you hear on the show at our website, thefairersense.com. You can always find me at ournextlife.com and Kara at bravelygo.co. 